It's my pleasure to welcome you to Creative Producers from A to Z. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session. Please welcome award-winning entertainment journalist, KJ Matthews. KJ? Hello, everyone. I <laughs> had to walk a little bit slow because I got my heel caught in the stairs a little bit earlier, so I was a little bit paranoid. I'm like, let me walk extra slow this time. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Hey. So happy that you guys decided to come to our session today. I, I feel like this is going to be the best session of the day, to be honest with you, because you have some of the most prolific producers, content creators, people leading uh, really big companies here in Hollywood, and I know you've heard of a lot of their, their companies and the work that they've done, so without further ado, I want to bring them to the stage so that we can get right to it. Uh, first up, I want to welcome Betsy Beers. <laughs> um, Betsy is creative partner at Shondaland, and of course, everybody here should have already heard of Shondaland unless you're living under a rock or you're not a real producer. <laughs> uh, basically, you know it's the company that was started by Shonda Rhimes, and um, it's got a lot of hits uh, under their belts, including Bridgerton and Inventing Anna. Um, and of course, uh, we have someone who's responsible for a lot of that here, Betsy. Let's welcome her to the stage, Betsy. Yay, thank you, Betsy. <laughs> uh, next, I want to welcome Jordana Malek. Now, Jordana is the president of Semi Formal Productions. If you haven't heard of Semi Formal Productions, you probably have heard of some of the work that they've created. Uh, they're the ones behind the hits, The Dropout on Hulu. You guys have probably seen that already. Um, and The Shrink Next Door on Apple TV. Uh, let's go ahead and welcome Jordana to the stage. And last but not least, uh, meet, is it Dante DiLoretto? I always get my Italian names mixed up. I'm so sorry if I got the last name incorrectly, but um, Dante is the president of Scripted Programming for Fremantle North America. And I feel like Fremantle is responsible for like, what, 50 to 70% of every single thing we always watch as our guilty pleasure on TV. Um, so yes, he's the president of Scripted Programming. Um, of course, Celebrity, uh, what is it, Celebrity Family Feud. You guys have got the X Factor. You've got everything. So uh, let's welcome Dante to the stage. Great, let's get into it. So you guys have had pretty long, illustrious careers, but I think a lot of people um, love to find out how you got where you are. It's usually this series of a lot of different decisions you've made in your careers, or decisions you didn't make. <laughs> and I'd love to hear from each of you kind of, you know, how you, how you got to the position um, that you're at today. Why don't we give it to the guy first, Dante? <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, you go, Don. thanks, thanks. There, um, there really was no intention or any alchemy behind it. Okay. Um, I think that uh, mostly it was about um, ricocheting um, uh, relationships over time, right. working with people when they were young and starting in the business, and then being called on them later to uh, to help them grow businesses. Um, for me, being a producer was uh, is about um, helping other people realize their vision, and that is what's has always been incredibly e exciting for me. Wonderful, Jordana. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's just been about not saying no to experiences early on in my career and learning as much as I could along the way and maintaining the relationships with the people that I admired along the way. Right. For me, so much of producing is about building a community and right. empowering the community that you build to do their best work. So I, you know, never really drifted from a relationship starting from, you know, early in my early life on. to now. Yeah. Wonderful. Betsy? You guys already gave all the good answers. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I started as an actor and I sucked. <laughs> so that was a really good entry in for me. And I think I pivoted pretty early on and realized that storytelling and the, uh, all the other aspects of storytelling were really incredibly compelling. And I think that what's amazing about this job for me was I discovered this place where I could do a little bit of everything and I could be of service in all these different ways to help somebody, to help build 
a project, mm -hmm. um, sort of see it through fruition, and also really, really support, as you said, the vision of a creator. And I made a pivot from movies to television a long time ago, actually, but wow. I think that was the biggest shift for me in terms wow. of that kind of storytelling, the difference between telling movie stories and telling TV stories. And I think digging in with writers um, and getting to watch from the beginning to the end has been the most amazing part. You know, the, the, the position creative producer um, is confusing to a lot of people. I, I mean, I think it is, they just don't really grasp kind of like what it is. And I'm wondering from you guys, why do you think that is? And in your mind, what is a creative producer? Any one of you guys can take that position or take the question. I'm happy to yeah, start the process. You go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think starting with why it's it's confusing, I guess. I think it's just because the producer title is confusing. And having come from film, um, a lot of people take that credit. So people don't know who does what. Right. Um, I'm sort of productive of that credit for that reason. But <laughs> I think... Um, I think that creative producers are there from the beginning to the end of a project in a lot of ways. So it's, it's and all the, the parts are respectable pieces of it, but I, I know for me it's very much starting with developing a project or finding IP and working with a writer and putting on a director and casting it and then hiring your crew and your department heads. And then when it's over, a lot of people, when production's over, a lot of people move on to the next job. And as a producer, you're still, you're still there for a long time, you know, editing and post and delivering and a lot. all of those things. Yeah. It's a lot. Dante, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's incredibly confusing, in, including for the people who employ us. Uh. Um, uh, <laughs> that you're, you're constantly needing to fight for the reason why you should be a line item in the budget, and it really only reveals itself over time. I think mm. that's that's the challenge. There may be somebody who's a credited producer who has brought a particular collection of talent or material together, and they're a line item, but are not necessarily needed or wanted to execute mm. services. There might be people who are, have any number of other roles, but ultimately it takes a, a, a kind of, uh, hopefully, a kind of calm maturity to, to see a project through. Um, right. there, these, particularly today, when it's 10 hours and it's, the, it's massive TV and um, there are any number of challenges, um, I think the role is increasingly important. And I, I'll use this simple analogy, which was, for me, I thought of uh, as uh, I also was an actor, a failed actor at one point. Same. <laughs> and, um, Maybe and, I knew. And you. I think the actor sees themselves as the bow sprint on a right. boat, you know, coming, kind of cutting through the water, and the director sees himself behind the helm, you know, steering the boat, and and maybe the writer is 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 the architect who's designed the boat that is sailing. But somebody had to go, hey, let's build a boat, and right. and ultimately, I think that's the producer's role, and to to. To, to see this through to its fruition and try to bring all these elements together as cohesively as possible. But our, yeah, the people who employ us still struggle with the idea of, well, why am I paying you until, right. <laughs> until it's too late to say, gosh, I really wish I had a really good producer here. Right, right. And I think the same thing for the writers that we, um, you know, I always say sort of, as you were saying, it starts, it's like pitch production through post and publicity. Mm. So it's every single aspect and I think it is that that weird thing about what you're saying, Dante, of like value added, that when you think about it in the olden times, before <laughs> any of you were born, <laughs> I don't think there was as much of a need for what we do in television because there were these production companies that were filled with producers that also financed television shows. So a lot of what we do in those days would have been, I mean, Grant Tinker's company is an example. Marcy Carsey was, you know, that, that Carsey Warner was an example. And there came this point in TV history, I would say maybe in the 90s, mm. where all the big corporations started basically becoming the production arm for shows, mm. which meant that all of a sudden there was this gap, which I would call the producing advocate. And that's no slight against some of the people who work at studios and are amazing and do an incredible job. But to have somebody who's really, really dedicated to preserving, protecting not only the voice of the writer, but the voice of the show, became something that when I started in TV and moved for movies, which was in the early 2000s, there was this 
desperate need for. And as you said, Dante, I think, the interesting thing about television was over the course of those 20 years, it, these shows got bigger and everybody's expectations were they were gonna look like movies and you were supposed to have lots of things going on and that becomes a lot for one person to manage. And too I think much. that's where, way too much. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where people like us sort of jumped in and said, we really want to help articulate and protect this vision and there's nobody doing it. So it's another reason why I think very often people don't know we exist or don't know what we do. Right. I think that what you're saying also about protecting is such a big piece of it because it's you're protecting your writers and your filmmakers, but you're also protecting the studios and the networks from each other and from a writer spinning out and from a bad draft of a script. Like there's so much of it that's like supposed to be very behind the scenes to help a project move mm -hmm. forward and protect everybody basically from themselves. Yeah, and I mean, I say jokingly, but the buck stops with me literally. Yeah. Like it's, we're yeah. responsible if with our producing, I mean Shonda's my producing partner, obviously Shonda Lynn, we're responsible, but I'll, t t t I, I take responsibility. It's nobody's fault, but th the people who are basically saying, all right, we're willing to take responsibility. So it's, it's part of the joy of the job. <laughs> you know what, I'm wondering with that responsibility, pre-pandemic, has your role um, changed at all because of the pandemic? I mean, of course, everything shut down two and a half years ago. Nobody was doing anything. <laughs> Nobody wanted to leave their house because we didn't know what was happening. But, but now I'm wondering, have you seen your roles change in the last two and a half years um, versus like 2019 versus what you're doing today? I don't know that, I feel like my roles changed, the methodology by which I do my job changed. Mm. Um, let me just tell you, posting an entire show on Zoom was really challenging to me since Oof. I am a Luddite. And they kept sending me different links to shit and it was really <laughs> confusing. Oh. Um, I but I got really did, good honestly. at it. I got That's really tough. good at it. It was <laughs> like amazing. Um, I, think, I think the methodology changed. I mean, I think we all got really good at communicating um, over over Zoom, but also with incredible um, technology now, which allows us to not be on set and watch mm. what's going on on set. Right. So I think what's interesting is I feel like the world of technology sort of caught up incredibly quickly with our needs, but I feel like I was doing pretty much the same job hmm. just from a distance. What do you guys think? I, you know, one of the things that's uh, really upsetting to me is the casting process and that uh, the the inability to be in the room with somebody Ugh, and, worst. and then when that person leaves the room to be able to have a conversation with the people there about that performer and the, the idea that you're making these really imp critical fundamental decisions um, at a distance um, is challenging. I do think um, less travel is not a terrible thing and uh, uh, the 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 technology the technology has been pretty remarkable. I just the communication is the most challenging because we mm. I can communicate through Slack and text and WhatsApp and emails and there are 15 different chains of communication and suddenly there's a back channel going on and another channel going <laughs> on and I think that is probably one of the more challenging parts of it. How do you keep open and clear communication, wh particularly when there are challenges? Well, so how often do you just lose material because I have so many channels? Yeah that yesterday I yeah. literally got on with somebody and I said, you've got to resend it on eight channels because otherwise I won't yeah. see it. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. definitely that piece. But I think that's true yeah. outside of the business. I, I sort of feel like everybody is going through that part. Yeah. Also like some of the little annoying things like wearing a mask on set, <clears throat> which like obviously we need to do, but it takes away the ability to whisper behind a monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like We're I gossiping. was like, yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're <laughs> like a creative producer right. and you're sitting behind a monitor with other producers or with the director, like so much of what you're doing is like watching and like talking about what could be done differently. And I had, you're, your chairs are distanced oh, yeah. and you have a mask on so you can't read lips and it really took like it was it was a big adjustment you'd start texting people that were right next to you <laughs> it's just, really that's yeah it's also i found that when you're sitting on set a lot of actors are checking right which is they're checking to see 
with what your expression is, as they should be. Because right. if you look like you're about to throw up, then obviously something <laughs> right. isn't going well, right? <laughs> so I found that over the years, like one of the most encouraging things is people can see you smile or laugh yeah. or look. And it kills expression, which means I think the anxiety factor all around, you, I mean, I've done a medical show for years where we had to like, cast people acted well with their eyeballs. Like yeah. it was mm. like we would go, How are they good eye actors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that person could really show love <laughs> while they're performing surgery. And I keep thinking about it now. I keep going, Am I a good eye actor? That's Can hilarious. I show full hostility with my eyeballs? <laughs> and you, you try to crinkle and smile a lot and shit. And it just doesn't do the same thing. Yeah. No, I I think Sometimes I joke that the only reason I've gotten where I am in my career is because I have extreme resting nice face, <laughs> which is like, I like, I think it's probably because I'm a mouth breather. Like, I'm always just like, and people, so every, every like director and writer I work with is so encouraged and wants me around because I like wow. have resting nice face and it really, I didn't. So are they really surprised it. when you say something really not nice? Or do you always do it with such a nice face I that think they don't that even know that, that you just face. said something? That's great. I think it's just the face. It really, it's like I'm always <laughs> smiling. Hilarious. Yeah. Well, my mouth turns down naturally. So, <laughs> everybody I work with, they sort of like, you have the worst poker face in the world, unless I'm on set, y'all. I'm really nice on set. But if I'm sitting in the office and something happens, everyone just sort of looks at me and goes, what? I'm like, nothing, nothing. They're like, Come on, <laughs> look at your little downturned mouth. So I guess I, I'm a natural scowler. I'm jealous. I think it makes you mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, I want to move on to kind of each of you guys are in, in different roles with different companies, and I'm wondering if you can kind of talk to me about kind of like what your day is like in percentages. Like what percentage is like 50 percent or 40 percent or 20 percent on a day to day basis from you know the time that you wake up. We'll start with you, Dante. Oh no. Like, <laughs> Like, what, um, what do you spend most of your day doing? Sure. So I, I have to just, for two seconds, really say what our company is and what we do, because it's, it's a little bit confusing. It's, yeah. Um, so we're a, collect, we're a global collection of producers around the world. There, um, we're, we, we produce more um, scripted foreign language content than any other company in the world, and obviously a lot of entertainment content. Um, and um, I, I'm the, the English language, US facing part mm -hmm. of the company here in North America. So my job is primarily um, development, primarily developing new television shows and building new um, relationships with platforms and growing the relationships that we, that we have. Right. Um, I spend 80% of my time considering new projects and new development. And that's an analysis of the material. It's an analysis of the creative um, elements of the material. And, and 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 then a lot of your own heart and your own passion because it's so incredibly hard to make anything that if you don't really care about it it might make sense on paper but it's not worth um, the years of wow. uh, process that it's going to take um, the uh, but but that's it for me it's it's a it's a lot of development and then and then um, maybe let let's say maybe it's sixty or seventy percent of that and then um, there's a certain degree of crisis management because production if you think about it. Um, what you're doing on set at that particular moment, nobody has ever done before, and they'll never do it again. And inevitably, there's some challenge, and hopefully, you've got a, a sea of talented people who can help navigate that. But very often, it percolates up, and you've got to get involved in the problem solving. Um, and once you've solved that problem, it doesn't really matter because you're never going to do that again. So you've got to figure out what you know what's coming down the road, and then. Um, but yeah, the, I, I'd say that's, uh, you know, and then a little tiny bit of it is the joy of actually the, the projects actually getting made. And, and I think that's what's fascinating about what we do, because if you look at the timeline, right. how much time is spent in development, concept, pitching, right. and particularly now when there's so much at stake for every series, and then when you're actually shooting it, it's actually a very, very brief period of time, because we're no longer, where not all of us get to make 22 episodes of TV anymore. <laughs> And 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 so the, the the production process is is very slim, and then you've got this immense tail to the content and the post production and the marketing and the distribution globally. Wow, uh, Jordana. I mean, I would not be able to break it up in percentages because mm. it's so different every single day. And I think producing is also so much of it is about multitasking. So I feel like I can be on set and then also simultaneously doing notes on a different project or something like that. Um, and then there's other days where I spend 90% of the day on the phone with my partner mm. discussing a decision that we 
are thinking of making, of a project we might make or a hire we might make. So, so much of it is, it shifts by the, the day, yeah, that right. I don't think that there's ever a, you know, I wish Maybe that that's I was the way organized it should enough be. that yeah, it could be definitely. percentages, but it's. I, I think, yeah, I'm team Jordana on this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it really, I, I can, I always say it's like best laid plans because I think I know what the day is like. There are always some set meetings and then the merit hits the gigantic spinning fan uh. and everything stops and for the rest of the four hours of the day are dealt with, you have to get this casting decision right away or there's a gigantic problem here or, so it's, it's a very, it's, it's both a very active job for part of the day because you're trying to solve problems, or you're putting together a project or, you're helping a writer through, or Shonda and I are working on, you know, a Shonda show, or wh which I, right. and then this other huge chunk of the day will all of a sudden be gone to, okay, what is the best way to strategize to solve this challenge or this problem? And I'd say every day a large, a good chunk of it is spent strategizing. Wow. Which is just, what's the best approach? How do you take the best approach? And there is a team of people at Shonda Land, all of whom are great. I mean, we have many different you know, departments, all of whom are incredible, and our creative group is uh, wonderful, but we're all, and we're all sort of in it together trying to figure right. out, okay, the delegation, but also who's doing what, but what is the best approach? And we have different people at different levels, which means what I'm also hoping we're doing is giving the next level the experience and the exposure, and then setting them off to be able to make a decision, and then, then there's the post game, yeah. where you see, if how it went and if you won the game or, <laughs> or not. <laughs> if you didn't. <laughs> there's there's one thing I left out of there was you mentioning strategy brought this to mind, which is um, for us it's tactics because I think we're in this tsunami of change in the business. We're, uh. we're in the midst of this tumultuous wave of, and you don't, you can pick up the paper or, or <laughs> there is no paper. You can, you can. You can <laughs> there is for school, Granny. Old school. <laughs> but you, you, can, read, loves you can read that breaking headline at four in the afternoon that suddenly changes everything about um, two years of planning about a particular project. And, and you know, for us it's tactics because you can't, you can't strategize about that change, you have to say, okay, that that's going left, we've got to go right, what are those right. opportunities? And that also, at least in this day and age, is a big chunk of what I do. Yeah, I, I'm thinking though too, because your day is, is changing, I mean, a lot of it seems like you're putting out fires too, a lot throughout the day. Um, what is the most challenging thing then about what you all do? I know it's different depending on the company you're with and the, the role that you've taken, but Today, in 2022, what's the most challenging thing about your roles? Any one of you guys can take that. Uh, for me, it's admitting what I'm powerless over, <laughs> I think, is, is uh, you well, know. That's a good one. Because I want to take response. I mean, I think all of us who assume these jobs want to take responsibility right. for everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a big chunk of this that we're not, that we you just don't have any control over. So, um, you know, that for me is, is really difficult. If there's a problem, I want to find the solution. And, right. and very often, you know, I, I can't. Um, I think... The stakes involved with television today are so high. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the compensation is so high, not necessarily to us, but to the creative elements you're bringing together. Th and the expectations become very large and it doesn't make it easier. It makes it much more challenging. So I think creative friction becomes um, a, a big, big challenge for us. Mm. I think one of the biggest challenges, not specifically I think for me, but just in the world is the the dearth of writer showrunners. So I think one of the biggest things is nowadays everybody's in a deal. Right. And um, you know, the, there may be people that you're dying to work with or you know would be perfect for a project. And th it's a, a lot of the um, focus for us is bringing people up through the world and bringing them to a place and supporting them, which is obviously a lot of what we do. But there's a lot of material floating around and finding the right people to champion that material and then helm material, I think is certainly always a challenge. Is it's, it's sort of the matchmaking part. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that very much. And I think like on a broader sense, some of it is 
like being discerning for me has become a constant kind of struggle within myself because it's like how I said starting my career was saying yes to every opportunity and then at some point there's like power in the no. Right. And I think, you know, I have, uh, my, my partner is a director um, and we're producing partners, but I also produce him as a director. Mm. And so it causes a lot of different conversations of like, what are we going to produce as a team? What's the project you're gonna direct that I'm gonna produce that fits our brand, but also where we wanna go? And looking at material in general and just being discerning, knowing that you're also kind of like, in a cheesy way, like holding other people's <laughs> hopes and dreams, which right. is like the pressure of that it's as well. You know, like I will wake up in the middle of the night sometimes remembering that there's an email that like, oh, you know, my aunt's friend's <laughs> child I've sent. had that happen yeah, many times. And that I'm like, she's waiting in Milwaukee where I'm from for the, her one connection to this world to right. respond. And you know, it's just, it's a, a weird pressure that you have to put well, it always places. happens when you're sleeping or when you're in the middle of the night, I think, because oh. your brain is finally resting. It's not running around and it's, right. you know, able to think freely. And you're like, oh, I didn't think about that or I forgot about that. Um, because your companies are all different, I'm wondering what does it take for you to give a project the thumbs up? Like, what are the qualities? What does it need to have in order to get your attention at this, at this point? That's you. That's, That's me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, first of all, for us, it has to be, I mean, Shonda and I, for years, have always said, and well, we've been working together pretty much since 2003, I guess. <laughs> so the rule was always, has always been, we really want to do something, we always want to do something we haven't done before. Oh, okay. You know, so I think rule number one is, is this something we haven't done before? Is this a story that we you know, haven't told, is this a world we haven't lived in? Is this, okay. um, I think that's a gigantic, a gigantic factor for us is just being able to, to, to play in a different playground. Right. Going and, to new territory. And I think most people, you know, the natural assumption is if you do something like X, and actors go through this a lot too, which is, but he was, he played such a good spy, mm. he should play a spy again. And it's the same thing for us, which is, okay, so we've, you know, told that sort of story. I think another thing for me is thematically that there's something, there's something going on and that it's actually about something besides what it's about. And I'm not a big fan personally and I don't think I'm good, a great contributor to what I'd call nihilistic storytelling, which is mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's just no point, which are sometimes very, very powerful pieces. I just that is probably not where my talent lies. And then probably the third thing for me is I love something that I see and I don't know how it's gonna end. Oh, okay. And that's probably because I was, I you know learned myself through network television, which goes a long way, but even with limiteds or even with a situation, a situation like Bridgerton, one of the great appealing things when I, first got over the fact that it was romance novels. Right. <laughs> and I started reading them was, oh my gosh, this woman has a billion children. <laughs> like every single season, another child has to get married. This is amazing. Right. This could go on forever. <laughs> like, can we just produce more kids? <laughs> um, but that also just in terms of the world, that world that there would be, uh, not only just practically, but just emotionally, mm -hmm. there's so many different directions to go that I can't really see where it's gonna end, and if I can't see where it's gonna end, then I get really excited. Yeah. Because- the Mystery. There's, yeah, there, and there's just, yeah, they're just open doors. Yeah. There's just lots of possibility. Well, I think audience loves that too. They love not knowing where you're taking them. I mean, that's, that's right. appealing, I think, to most audience members, for sure. Yeah. Um, what about you, Jordana? I mean, I think that there's different pieces of it, and it evolves as we go and learn what we're good at. For for Mike and I, we started the company, we had made a little mo tiny movie together called Hello, My Name is Doris, and we really found like a voice together that we loved, which was stories that had unconventional leads and had um, humor and heart and were hopefully commercially viable. And so when we started 
looking for things, it was very much that. It was very much like, what can we, what are, it comes from character very much for us and who do we want to spend time with and who have we not seen before in this situation or circumstance. And then as we did more and more, mm -hmm. um, it, it can become something where we were more drawn to things that were less obviously that and that we could make that, you know? Right. So what is a story like The Dropout or something where we can bring some levity to it and bring a tone that we are very proud of that we've found together and, you know, put that on a story that might not obviously be a huge comedy or, you know, something like yeah. that. And I love your spin, you guys spin on The Dropout. I mean, I think a lot of people are, already knew about Elizabeth Holmes. She's been in the news a lot. But the spin that you guys took on it was really um, the approach was nice. Yeah, and I, I think, really thank you. That. I think some of it, too, is just finding something redeeming inside of these characters. Right. I think, you know, we felt that with, with the eyes of Tammy Faye, too, where you just find a character that you really want to delve into and understand why they tick. And so stories like that are always appealing. But like what Betsy said, you know, I remember when we made Doris and, you know, it was like there was everything we got was just like something with a 70 something year old lead female, you know, like, and it was like, and that's great. I right. love working with, with women, but it was very much. It there are was lots very, of different types of women. Very different types. Out. It was very much that over and over again. And I think you know now it's like, if there's a podcast that has you know a true crime element, like we we get it and it's great. But at some point, you know, you're like, I I don't want to do that again. So yeah. And that's hard too now because true crime is like, I'm I'll, I'll admit I'm addicted. Oh yeah. Like Friday night Dateline. Oh yeah. Even call oh yeah. Me. Oh yeah, <laughs> calming, so, yeah, calming. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's it's very much a true crime world now, yeah. so it's hard to to turn those kind of stories down. Yeah. Dante, I'm wondering what what gets your attention. What does your company need to see now? Uh, I, it's not our company because I, you know, our our job is to is to hopefully be an asset to the creative talent who wants to tell the story. But what for me the. Uh, uh, it, it's the simple premise that there is no new story. We're, we're t finding new ways to tell old stories. Right. So, um, and generally, it's always about character, and that sometimes is within the story, but it's also the story behind the people who want to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And so, I have to I have to look at the material, and I have to look at the people who are pursuing the material, and say. Is there a narrative about this? Is is there actually a story about the making of this project and these people and why they want to make the project and why it should be made today that feels undeniable? Because what we do as an independent is we have to come in not, you know, as a really good solid project. We've actually got to go in and, and beat out all the internal development that's going on on any number of these platforms and, and it has to feel separate and apart in such an undeniable way. So uh, it, that is about the the characters and the story and and what is inventive about this version of that story, and then it's about the quality of the collection of people and and the story they want to tell. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> in Hollywood, a lot of it obviously, as any in industry, is about your talent and your expertise. But much of Hollywood is about relationships and maintaining relationships. And you guys um, have to maintain a lot of these relationships from you know the pitch to the production to when it actually airs, which can be a very long time. You're working with a lot of different partners. I'm wondering, um, how do you maintain that relationship? Because I'm sure there are many challenging times you know, where you guys have disagreements or a project started one way and now it's turned into something different as you get towards post. And I'm wondering, um, how do you guys maintain the, the relationships, those relationships that you really need to maintain as you move projects forward? I, I mean, it's such a complicated <laughs> question. I feel like generally I like to take a minute at the beginning to like assess who the people are that I'm dealing with and then try to figure out what what is the appropriate space for me. Okay. Um, because I feel like there's so much, there's so many different points of coming into a project and I've come where, you know, I've been at the very, very beginning of it and I've brought in partners and different people and felt, you know, all different things and then there's times when I come on to something 
after there's been people working on it for a really long time, and you, you want to figure out what people's, other people's roles are mm -hmm. and their personalities and find a way to be helpful and you know not step on toes. And I think that that helps maintain the relationship as you go because so the needs change as you go. Right. So I want to always be there to be able to step up and be like, I'm here and I can, I can do this. Right but not do that in, if it's not needed just because I feel right. that way. And I think just in terms of relationships in general, I mean, it is what we do. And I, I love that part of the job. I love meeting people and and keeping them in my life. And, and I think for us, so much of it is when we're doing the next thing to be like, oh, there was a writer I worked with on a show that I think would be so great for this idea or, I loved the DP on that tiny movie. They would be so great for this series. Like, mm. and and so it's not just like for the show, but it's kind of the extent of right. your your creative career a little bit. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, you're you're assessing each situation, you know, and determining where you're needed and where you may not be needed as much. So that takes a strong person to do that for sure. Dante. Um, I, look, I, I think the, at the core of this is television is incredibly hard to make and super easy to criticize. Uh, and um, I, I was once there's sitting... There's more critics okay, than there are sand. I, I, I was once sitting at the beach. A, a, a table full of really, <laughs> Everywhere. really talented people who were talking about this half-hour television show they wanted to make, and they were, it was, it was, they were just a great, great group of people. And I, and I, but I suddenly realized that I was the only person in the room that had ever made an episode of television before. And I sort of got caught up in this enthusiasm, and I recognized that... that, that um, that having watched a lot of television doesn't necessarily make you good at making television. Mm. Um, you may have a lot of uh, there, that part right there. Y y that part right there. He just said. You, <laughs> so, but I but I also recognize that what we're desperately in need of uh, is fresh new approaches. My God, we're remaking formats from the '90s and the the aughts and whatever. I mean, we're we're, we're desperate for fresh voices, and yet it's incredibly hard to make it. So, how do you create, as Betsy was saying, a nurturing environment for emerging voices how, how do you how do you create this this healthy space and how do you take the most creative person in the room and put them in charge of a hundred million dollar company with 400 employees it, I mean it's it's um, so what I'm trying to get at is that inevitably there's a lot of friction mm -hmm. um, and the further down the road you get the more friction there's going to be and you have it's impossible to judge how people are going to evolve, and and it's it's dependent on us to try to be a, a keel, using the the bad boat metaphor again, but really to, to try to keep everybody pointed in the right direction. It's hard, and and, and uh, so much of it is about um, uh, ego and the the fragility of mm. the creative ego, and how do you support somebody and give them critical feedback at the same time? How do you create a nurturing environment and bring out the best in somebody? I, I think. I've worked with a, a number of first-time directors. Um, I, I'm working with first-time writer, um, writer showrunners, um, and it. What's interesting is to be somebody who wants to be in that position requires a great deal of self-determination, mm -hmm. and and inevitably maybe a resistance to criticism, a resistance to feedback, and so finding ways to be supportive but direct in, in your criticism and steerage is, is, uh, is the challenge. Yeah, it's, it's definitely hard, I would imagine. Um, I know I didn't put this on my list, but I'm wondering, are there any projects out there now that you guys look at and say, man, I wish we had that. I wish I had thought about that. Or I wish we had an opportunity. Anything you like outside of your own company, basically? Wow. Yeah, anything <laughs> anything that Betsy has done, pretty yeah. much. You know, I'd like to that's touch. Funny. I'd like funny, to touch Dante. any one of those. That's, that's See, they're not being critics. They're supporting each other. <laughs> I love see, that. You know, exactly. I was, the real would be an extra in Bridgerton. I'm <laughs> <that out> <laughs> we could we could definitely work that out. You and I can like talk after. Um, there, there's there's so much. I mean, I remember secession starting and just going like I, I don't I have no I don't I mean uh. it's. It's a great show. It's a great show. I mean, there's yeah. so many shows that I can point to 
where, I mean, Tammy Faye is another great, I, like, I just flipped. Very you well know, it just, so I think, I think it's just such a joy to your point, Dante, it's like, a, it's such a joy when you actually, first of all, we all do criticize, and sometimes I think what with what we do, there's a lot of a critical eye, but there's also a critical eye to learn something. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do now is I watch things instead of, I mean, with obviously I watch things and don't like them sometimes, but <laughs> it's, it's watching and trying to learn, learn from why I'm not why I'm not responding to something or why I'm not reacting. That's a lot of the conversations that we have. But there's, given the amount of TV that's out there right now, can we call it TV? Is it, is it screens or something? Yeah. I don't, we need a new term. It needs to be like screws or something. But there's, there's a ton of, Great I mean, stuff out there, I'm really. freezing right now because you asked me what I, what no, I like. Well, I was going to say congratulations on inventing Anna. I think um, with my younger cousins, watched that like seven times already. Oh, thank you. One time with myself and then six times with them, and I learned something new every single time. And they, you guys made me so fascinated. And now I'm like following the real Anna, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out like where's her situation? Oh, and and it's yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. No, yeah. and what I'm really proud of about that show, I've got to say that's – I'm real. I'm just. I, I'm very proud of that. I think that what I loved was that we took instead of saying like what you did in a genius way with Elizabeth Holmes. We went. What maybe we can't really know this person, but what if we understand the effect or this person through the lens of all the mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. did know her and how they were touched and how they all ended up succeeding. Right. Based on her, or moved forward. Um, so I'm. I'm glad that that's on your. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love Tammy Faye, too, of course. <laughs> I'll say one that I, I, I was, I avoided watching and then I couldn't stop watching was Chernobyl. And to me, the, it, it oh, was right. a reinvention of the disaster movie. I think it was like a slow motion Poseidon adventure. And when and what was interesting about it is, for me, is it was so engaging, but the creative decisions they made in the execution, the fact that they all had regional British accents, um, and and I didn't I didn't bat an eye, that there was a, a, a kind of wit to it as well in the makeup, in the, execu in the details of the execution that was startling and, and really engaging. I, I, you know, I, I just, I, I marveled at the collection of creative decisions that were able to pull that off and the people who were, um, the, had the, the foresight to, to green light it. Yeah, no, it's always great. Is there anything that caught your eye, Jordan, that you I watch? I mean, you like anything that I watch that I like, I wish that I had <laughs> made. Day, yeah. And I also am like, aware that it wouldn't have been what it was if it was me, okay. you know? Exactly. Yeah. Like, I think that's the interesting right. thing is I sit and go like, oh, you know, I love Fleabag. Yeah, totally. Uh, fl if I could have been a fly yeah. on the wall during Fleabag, not to use too many insect metaphors in the same sentence. <laughs> but I, I just, but then I think it might have been great, It might, but it would have been different. And it is that thing of the joy of being able to watch somebody do something beautifully and you get to be the audience is incredibly relaxing. And the hypervigilance in all of us, I think, pulls back a little bit. Totally. Because I think the perfectionism, I would say hypervigilance and endless concern at four in the morning. Right. You know, and the dog's barking in your head that right. you forgot about the nice lady in Milwaukee. Right. <laughs> is, it's, that's what I love about this business is there's all of this amazing content for us to lose ourselves in, and in that little period of time, you can pop out and you can learn something that you may be able to apply and may make something better that you make. Which so many real is life stories, you know, you just turn on the news and so many cast of characters um, out there every single day, you know, to to be able to put on the small screen and the big screen. So love that you people know how to do that. You do it well. That's why you're sitting up here. <laughs> um, I want to thank all you guys for, for being on the panel, but I do want to turn it to our audience now and allow them to um, ask this talented group any questions that you may have about their career, or what they do, or their company. Um, does anyone have questions down here? Or we'll, we'll start with our gentleman right here out front. <laughs> I don't know if we can get him a microphone, or if we can't, we'll just have I him stand. Oh, there's a, okay, there's... It's just right there. They're already standing in line. I'm sorry about that. You, you guys are lined up. I love it. Orderly, orderly. We'll take the first guy who lined up then, who was standing in line first. Oh, <laughs> on oh okay. Wonderful. Go um, right ahead. Yeah, this, this is a great 
Uh, you're right, it's one of the best so far. Yay. Um, I yes. guess we're competitive. We love, it. We love being Does that winners. Mean we're are we winners? Are we winning? You guys are winning. Right, totally, 100%. Awesome. Um, if you were talking to your younger self before you like jumped into it, right? After the acting thing, but you were just you know, jumping off, and you, your, your younger self said to your older self now, I have three projects. Which one should I do? Which one should I jump into and spend the next three to five or more years giving my heart and soul to? What would you say to that younger self with all your experience now? Hmm. Gosh, you, it almost makes me want to cry. I think it's that. <laughs> really, it's Great a question, though. Story. Do I have time to call uh, my it, therapist? It really, you, you know. You know I, I think w one of the joys of getting older is you know in your heart, right? Um, when you're young, you're like trying to seize every opportunity. Right. Here's somebody who wants to make a short film. I'll help them. Here's this. And then there's that one story that sticks in your mind, that character, that thing that comes back to you year after year after year. And that's it. That's the one. I, I have a project that I, I was involved on and off again for 28 years before it got made, and I was Certainly would never get made, but it you know, it lives inside of you in in a way. Yeah, I I think like for me it was like it. I remember being in my early twenties and reading lots and lots and lots of scripts, just trying to develop my taste and understand what was what. And I had read a script that was written by. The, these two writers, Susanna Fogel and Joni Lefkowitz, who I ended up producing, my first movie was they, they wrote and Susanna directed, but I read this script and I knew I didn't have the power or the ability or anything at that stage to really get it done, but I fell in love with this voice. I felt really seen by their voice and, and, and I knew that I wanted to, at some point in my career, work with them and and I wanted them to tell all the stories because I just felt like they wrote in this way that I, that I really related to. And so I think it's like really just paying, like I, I would just pay attention to what you love as you're learning and not forget it so that you can always come back to it when you, when you do have the resources. Yeah, I think it's don't do what everyone, what you think everyone expects you to do and try to think about, sometimes the barking dog at four in the morning is good and not bad, and it's that thing that you keep coming back to that maybe you feel like isn't what you should be doing, but you can't stop thinking about. Because I think especially when you're younger, there's a lot of pressure to do what people expect of you. And I remember when I first started, I was offered a job, and my spidey sense was just like, I don't think this is the right job, and there were no jobs at that point, and it was the only job that was being offered to me, and I remember going back and and I didn't take the job, and that was a gigantic turning point for me because almost immediately after the job opened up, that actually got me into development, that pushed me forward. So I think when you're younger, it's follow your instinct, try not to follow the voice outside of your head. Mm. Great advice. Yeah, trusting your gut. Thank Very you. Very great. Let's go to this side and have the young ladies in line first. Yes, hi, thank you so much for this panel. It's been wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you about protecting your artists and vision and their voice, particularly at the beginning stages when they're maybe trying new ideas and trying to experiment with, you know, maybe something that is a little bit out of the box and you're dealing with executives or studio people who are a little more nervous to allow that idea to kind of allow the writer to figure out how to execute it before they figured it out and just protecting that kind of space in between them knowing they have an idea but haven't figured out how to execute it and then having people who are really nervous to allow that expression to unfold. For me, I think a lot of it is um, figuring out and I'll be curious to see what, what you two say too is it's a gigantically important question because especially when an idea is relatively new and after maybe you've just pitched it and they're expecting an outline or I think a gigantic part of what we do is I would say the buffering in between and the managing of expectation and sometimes depending on the writer it's really important that um, you you communicate with the powers that be first mm. so that 
what I always try to do, if the writer, I've had writers who want to be right in the scrum from the beginning, no matter how inexperienced or not, and then other writers who, who really need to be costed and protected, and, and who you know because you've been working with them will hear information very differently if it's presented in a, in a way that you know that they will understand. So in many cases, I think what we have to do is, and with any good studio or network executive or financer, they just want a good project too. So I think if you're working with an executive that you trust or you know you can trust, you develop a kind of rhythm so that you can develop your system based on the writer's preference. And in the case of a more nuanced or inexperienced person, very often I think it's taking, it's running a lot of interference and doing a lot of translation. Because sometimes when a note is given out of fear, and not all of them are, but if you do have an expectation, you know, and you're paying for it and you want to see a particular thing, it may get there eventually. And what, or it may not, but very often it's a matter of making sure that the notes aren't jumping the gun and getting the information to the writer that you know will push the project further in the direction that you know the writer wants to go and you believe the larger, in the larger picture will be best for the project. That was a lot of words to say one sentence, <laughs> by the way. But you get the point. The, on, the only thing I would add to that is, is that um, the buffer is such a great term, is that ultimately your, the, the, your key is that creative partner, that the, the executive partners are wonderful and it's important to have those really good relationships, but th your value is nurturing that relationship with the creative partner and getting from them what it is that's going to make them successful. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's important not to... Um, uh, to, to, to view it ever as adversarial. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think for me, I always try to keep the, like to, to be responsible for big picture. So I keep the bigger thing in mind and create a bubble or a space for the writer to do what they need to do. So I like always know where we need to go and but I want them to go through their process to get there because that's my job is to know their process and understand it. And then sometimes it's also when you work with people that are a little bit further along in their careers, I think um, I will sometimes have conversations with executives and say like, I know how this person works. So I think it's best if we present this in that way to them because they'll receive it well, and they'll be productive, and all that stuff. So it's a little bit of very much the buffer. The buffer is the way. Yeah, great advice, guys. I was going to say, thank you for that question, by the way, before I move on. I'd like to move back to this side and have the gentleman at yes, the mic Yes, so uh, thank you, guests and KJ. I appreciate this panel. Um, this, this question is, is for all of you, but the examples I'm just going to cite uh, pertain to inventing Anna and the dropout. Uh, but Dante, don't be discouraged from answering. <laughs> um, Jump in, baby. So my, my question is, when you have a project like that where it's, it's so critical to capture the zeitgeist and you want to be first to market, but you also you have a creative vision that you want to protect, and so much of it is playing out like in the press or in the courtrooms, for instance, mm -hmm. um, how do you preserve that dramatic integrity and not be a slave to the truth and at the same time oh, deal yeah. with the E&O of it all? So, yeah. <laughs> well, holy moly! Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, for, first of all, the zeitgeist part—I I have no control over. Like when we optioned the article in, whenever it was, 2016, 2017. Um, it would have been 17. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I've lost track. The COVID has taken two yeah. years away. Right. <laughs> so as far as I'm it's concerned, COVID time. It's 1842. <laughs> um, but I think you always hope that because a project takes so long to make, um, and honestly, we were, Shonda was writing and the group were like, she was designing that show while the court case was going on. Mm. So it actually was kind of concurrent. Um, I think like, for example, the way that she decided to approach the material gave us a lot more freedom in terms of what we focused on. And a lot of it was really in Jessica Pressler's article. Mm -hmm because she sort of followed all these different people. I think that gave us a lot more leeway and 
gave us a little more runway in order to tell as many different stories as we want and push it into different directions. But I think one of the biggest dangers, as you say, look, we were lucky that at the point where we launched, as you were too, that it was still a relevant topic. And I remember a little earlier before, you know, there was a, you know, is the true crime series dead and yeah. blah, 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 blah. I'm like, man, look at the staircase, you know? It's like, oh no, by the way, apparently it's not dead, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, but that's, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I think, I think some of the like creative liberty part of it, I would say, you know, Liz Merriweather was the creator for that show. And I think so much of it was like getting into the psychology of that person, but also like, you know, something I talked about before, finding a way to relate to Elizabeth Holmes. So so you can take some creative liberty because you're you're getting inside there and you're putting, you know, you're you're creating a character that exists inside of a character that's a real person. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yep. Oh, for great. the most part, thank you. <laughs> oh, and I, I think we have time for one more question actually on this side. I'd like to give it to the Okay. <laughs> well, first, thank you for your input. It's so valuable. And my question is, if you had a crystal ball, what would you see as the longevity for the popularity of true crime? It's endless. Long, <laughs> it's like, very long. Yeah, very long. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, uh, yeah. I don't think it's ever, and I think it's it, never been out. It's of, never been out, and I think I think it moves platforms. I mean, I think we go through periods where it's very, very present on the screen. Podcasts have then reinvented the entire genre. Mm -hmm. I think if a series of books came out, I think it's always there as a genre, and I think the most it does maybe is hop around platforms, but yeah. it's pretty much been. I think a constant. And in, in, in procedurals, one Adam 12 or even ER, they were all drawing from true true um, events in, in, into their stories. So I, th I think I think it's looking good for true crime. <laughs> Definitely. So you have fun common crimes. Speaking of true crime, just wondering, do you do you have one that you like? <laughs> a true crime story, a true crime uh, film or anything? Are you aficionado of true crime? Well, yes, and for better or worse, it's followed me. Um, you know, I, I was first and foremost, I believe that documentaries that have been already mentioned today, and especially the great job that has been done at Shondaland, that they have been hot. It's just a question is, I mean, for me, myself personally, how hot will they remain over the next 10 to 12 years? I think it's very much what Betsy said. Like, the genre, the genre and the way of doing it can can change and evolve, and I don't think people want to do the exact same thing they just did. But I think it's it's a story, you know. It's a like it's so much easier in so many ways to create a story from something that exists, or you know, IP, or you know, an event that happened because the plot is there. So I think that it'll stories will keep coming from, from true crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for attending our session. I really hope you learned a lot. You got the best in the business up here. So I just wanna That's thank up. Dante, thank Jordana, and of course thank Betsy for uh, taking the time out of their schedule to come out here and speak with you guys about their business and the career. And we just wanna thank them and thank you guys for attending. And thank you. And thank you, thank KJ. You. Thank you, KJ. Very much. Thank you.